1979, the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia to overthrow the regime of Pol Pot, responsible for the biggest act of genocide in history, and to replace it with another reign of terror. In 1985, Hang Noor received an Oscar for his performance in the film The Killing Fields. Since then, this man, who had himself been a victim of the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese, has decided to dedicate his life to helping the Cambodian refugees who are still waiting after nine years for peace to return to their battered country. The winner is... Dr. Hang! This railroad does not lead anywhere. I consider this as the symbol of the end of the freedom and peace of my country. Also the symbol of the dramatic situation of the Cambrian refugees in the camps along the thai Cambrian border. Hang Noor is talking about has its terminus here at Aranyaparetet, a town on the frontier between Thailand and Cambodia. Nobody has taken the train to Phnom Penh from this station since Vietnamese troops occupied Cambodia. The border remains immovably closed. Hang Noor is a regular visitor to this quiet little Thai town. It's here that the various relief organizations which help the hundreds of thousands of refugees are based. And it's here, after many long hours of traveling, that he can get back to the camps to bring comfort and help to his fellow countrymen. Here is my country, Cambodia. Since almost 10 years, my country is occupied by Vietnamese troops. These occupations has created so many refugee camps like this one. Here, in the refugee camps, hundreds of thousands of Cambodian refugees rely only on the help provided by humanitarian organizations and other donors. As Hang Noor says, without organized support, these refugees would have no future. Here, at the Site 2 camp, dozens of tanker lorries bring each day's water from a source more than 100 kilometers away. That water is then distributed to the refugees at the rate of 17 litres each, barely a bucketful, which has to serve the families for drinking, as well as for washing themselves and their clothes. With food, on the other hand, distribution is less regular. Rice, for example, the basic daily diet of the Cambodians, is handed out just once a week. On this day, in the early hours of the morning, Crowds of refugees, men, women and children, 
have made their way to the distribution centre to await the arrivals of lorries belonging to UNBRO, the United Nations organisation in charge of coordinating relief aid for the camps. As soon as the precious cargoes arrive, the job falls to appointed commers to distribute the rice according to the needs of each family and the number of children that they have. These shares are then passed on to other Cambodians who act as leaders of small groups or areas and they redistribute them to their people. The whole process can take many hours, hours during which the refugees must wait in baking heat which can reach 40 degrees centigrade or in torrential rain. They then have to carry their provisions back to their huts using whatever limited forms of transportation they have available. For most of them that means a long walk. The camp extends to an area of more than five square kilometres. But the day the rice is distributed has also become market day. The camp is administered by the Cambodian government in exile and its Khmer leaders have reached an agreement with the Thai authorities. The result is that for several months now, Thai peasants have been permitted to come and sell their produce to the Cambodians. The market also provides the Khmers with their only opportunity to break the monotony of their lives, to make contact with the outside world and to bring some variety, however small, into the daily diet of the refugee families. The little money the refugees have normally comes from whatever savings they were able to bring with them into exile. The rest have to rely on bartering, or perhaps selling some of their rice to buy fruit or vegetables. Some make small figures out of papier-mâché and sell them to the Thais, or to foreign relief workers. After their long years of life in the camps, for some of them it's been more than nine years, and with little hope of an improvement in their present condition, the Khmers have become resigned to their fate and have set about organising themselves accordingly. A new community has been created here and the good-natured attitude of the Khmer police shows how totally powerless the Cambodian administration is, all of which gives the impression of a peaceful people going about their daily business. But it's no less true now than ever it was that these hundreds of thousands of refugees are still living through an enormous human drama. because in reality these camps are vast prisons containing hundreds of thousands of men, women and children whose only crime was to want to escape from the war waged against the Khmer resistance by the forces of Phnom Penh and their Vietnamese supporters. Most of the camps, like Site 2 for example, are close to the Cambodian border, some of them just a few hundred meters from the combat zones. That's why Vietnamese artillery fire directed at Khmer rebel positions often fall there. When it does, there's an immediate evacuation of all the relief workers, sometimes for several days, forcing them to abandon the refugees to their fate. These incidents cause a lot of damage and add to the casualty lists, increasing the level of confusion and despair in the camps. Camps condemned to wait until a political solution restores peace to their country and allows them to return to their villages.
These refugees, of whom half are under 15 years old, have no official status. They can't ask for asylum in a third country. They're not even classed as illegal immigrants. Officially, they have no legal existence at all. They're non-persons. To make matters worse, the population increases by 5% each year. That means more children born, often in poor hygienic conditions, and whose hope of life is closely linked to the aid provided by the relief organizations. For many of the elderly, life ends here, and in a last rite, their ashes are carried by the wind back to a Cambodia they'll never see again. Haing Ngo knew this ordeal. He lived in one of the camps himself. This human suffering caused by the Vietnamese occupation of my country. I experienced it myself here in this area, but in my mind, I was more lucky than those who are winning some of them since more than nine years, misery and despair. This is why, since so many years, I have dedicated my life to my people. The refugees have never been able to see the film The Killing Fields, which made Hang Nor famous. They haven't even got electricity. But he's still a well-known personality in the camps because for many years he's continued to go back there. Firstly, to offer his services as a doctor to the wounded at the Khao Dang camp. Then, at visiting time, when, as at site two, he freely mixes with the people to bring comfort in his own way to women, children and the elderly. He attaches equal importance to the young on whom he lavishes encouraging words. They're the ones, he says, who will restore the country when it's free. It's through his involvement with the people in the camps at every level that he finds out how their living conditions are developing and what special needs they have so that he can better plead their case later with the governments of different countries. His visits to the camps offer the refugees their greatest glimmer of hope. Mostly my people has too much disease, malnutrition, malaria, uh, diarrhea, dysentery, TB at the border, and mostly the children go die almost every day. At least uh, we have uh, 140,000 refugees in a camp. The nurses working for the relief organizations come face to face with a variety of illnesses and deficiency problems. Apart from illnesses brought on by malnutrition and the poor living conditions in the camps, there are also those resulting from the long walks the refugees were forced to make at the time of their exile. Malaria, TB, dysentery and other tropical diseases are just a few examples. But there are also physically handicapped people and others who've been wounded and they require more specialized treatment. Here there are long sessions of essential therapy. Most of the time these treatments are given by the residents of the camps themselves because only the Khmer are allowed to stay after four o'clock in the afternoon. That's why it's so important for the relief programs to provide an adequate medical training so that the refugees can continue to look after their own handicapped people. 
far from the camps, negotiations are underway. For two years, representatives of the Vietnamese authorities, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, and the opposition coalition have been meeting to look for ways to restore peace. The only obstacle remains the eventual participation of the Khmer Rouge in any future government. On this point, Hun Sen, the Phnom Penh Prime Minister, is immovable. He wants the forces of Pol Pot to disappear altogether. Son Sun is the leader of another opposition group, and as he says, he hopes international pressure from Western countries can persuade the Soviet Union to end its support for the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia. Prince Ranarid, spokesman for his father, Prince Noradim Sihanouk, who's leading the negotiations, also believes there can be peace in Cambodia if the Soviet Union and China can get back to a normal relationship, as they're now trying to do. Looking at these Thai peasants, apparently working peacefully in their fields, it's hard to imagine that a great human drama is taking place just a few hundred meters away. Such reassuringly peaceful scenes, more suitable perhaps for a tourist brochure on Thailand, mustn't make us forget just how close is the frontier and its dangers. Thailand may have been able up until now to save its people from the sad fate of its neighbors in such countries as Laos, Burma, Cambodia and Vietnam. But very often in these border areas, the peasants fall victim to the Khmer conflict. The border is practically non-existent in the paddies and across the fields. And at night, when the Vietnamese soldiers plant anti-personnel mines to prevent the guerrillas from crossing from one country to another, they don't bother about checking which side of the border they're putting them. That's why many Thai peasants have been blown up when they've returned to their fields in the morning. But the greatest number of victims are still to be found among the hundreds of Cambodians who try to flee their country to seek refuge in Thailand. Every day, many of my countrymen still try to escape Vietnamese occupation by closing the border, mostly at night and by foot. Those crossing which Cameron hope to be their way to freedom and peace result many times in drama and death. To hinder the border crossing, the Vietnamese army has planted landmines and shoot on sight. Whereas in many cases of men, women, and children severely injured. Most of them are to hour of pain if they are safe in time, are in such a bad shape that they have to be amputated. Fortunately, several humanitarian programs give the opportunity to most of them to be taken care of. Following the technique used by the Soviets in their anti-guerrilla war in Afghanistan, the Vietnamese and the Khmer Rouge rebels use landmines specially designed to mutilate. Military planners believe that a serious wound requiring surgery is a heavier burden than a death. The dead can be buried where they fall. That's why those who survive a mine detonation are horribly mutilated. Often they must wait hours before receiving any help at the risk of bleeding to death. By the time they arrive at the Red Cross Hospital, it's too late to save their injured limbs, either because they're torn to pieces or because gangrene has already set in. Only amputation is left. The Red Cross carries out almost 30 such operations a month. But not all the amputations are carried out by the Red Cross. Some are done on the spot by the Khmer fighting units in the guerrilla camps. Often the conditions are so bad that another operation is necessary when the victims reach the camps. Whenever Haing Nor visits the camps, he takes every opportunity to go and see those who suffered mutilation, so he can check on their progress and offer what help he can. He also gives his support to every initiative aimed at allowing the amputees to lead lives as normal as possible.
like so many other Cambodian people. She crossed the border and hit a Vietnamese mine. She lost her leg and her baby because she was pregnant. Thanks to humanitarian organization, after being amputated, she got a prosthesis which made her live almost normally. Chia is another war victim. She's barely 18. A mine blew off her leg when she tried to cross the border to join her brother in a refugee camp. Can Kim is 34 years old. While he was in a camp close to the border, Vietnamese artillery started firing at nearby Khmer guerrilla positions. He received bad shrapnel wounds in the leg and arm. The lack of immediate medical attention meant that he lost his leg and his arm will always be paralyzed. Thanks to therapy sessions, he too will soon be able to walk almost normally. Many other victims of explosions can be fitted with artificial limbs mainly made with locally available materials. These are Cambodian refugees, often handicapped or explosion victims themselves who make them, while others have been trained to fit them properly and to help the victims use them. Thousands of these limbs have already been fitted, giving the great number of disabled people the chance of leading more normal lives. It's this kind of caring program Heng Noor supports. But his efforts to help his fellow countrymen aren't restricted to visits to refugee camps to assist in giving treatment and comfort. He carries on his fight every day with awareness campaigns, petitions to heads of state, conferences, fundraising, writing articles and giving a great many interviews. Mostly my people need help, need international help, need international assistance, whatever humanitarian assistance or medical assistance that my people need help. If uh, my country will be free one day soon, so that my people still need to go back home. They want to go back home, they want to, want, they want to see one day freedom, they want to see her country or the homeland have real peace. I hope if, uh, for example, if Vietnamese troops will withdraw from my country tomorrow, I need international peacekeeping forces to stay in Cambodia as long as my country necessary. The world has no right to forget those 360,000 refugees. It is the worst can happen to them. In the eyes of the Cameron refugees, I have seen some hope I cannot disable them. I will return to my country, even if the border remains closed and if I have to walk day and night, cross rye fields and cross the mine fields. But I hope very soon the way to freedom.